Well, welcome everyone to an a interdisciplinary panel discussion coordinated by the Mental Health Professionals Network. Uh, welcome, I understand there's 174 people or 175 people now online and 837 registrations for this webinar. Uh, I'm Professor Shantha Rajaratnam, I'm from Monash University in Melbourne uh, and I'll be facilitating tonight's session. Uh, I'm an academic psychologist. I lead a research group particularly focused on the impact of sleep disorders uh, on health. Uh, I have a stellar panel that's joining me uh, to participate in the webinar tonight, and I'd like to briefly go through and introduce each of the panel members. Now, uh, a bio was distributed uh, along with the materials for the webinar, so I won't go into too much detail. Uh, I'd like to introduce first Dr. Christine Boyce. Uh, Christine will be providing the GP perspective on the panel tonight. Uh, Christine, welcome. Uh, great Thank to you. have you with us. Thanks very much. Uh, great to be here. Christine, I understand you're well recognized uh, for all of your uh, interests in refugee health. Can you tell us a little bit about how this uh, interest came about? Um, yeah, sure. That can be fairly succinct. Um, I saw one refugee, a former Kosovar, back in 1999, and um, I was able to work with an interpreter, and I didn't feel so lonely in my consultation room anymore because there were three of us, and I just thought, I'll do more of this because this is more fun. Great. Great to have you here, Christine. So uh, also joining us is Professor Nicholas Proctor from Adelaide. Uh, he's going to be providing a mental health nursing perspective. Uh, Nicholas, I see from your bio that you have a particular expertise in knowledge transfer and community engagement in mental health. Could you tell us a little bit about the challenges in translating mental health uh, research into practice? Um, look, it's, it's, uh, the biggest challenge is, is with mainstream mental health services. Um, they're there can be a reluctance to be open to um, thinking about new ways of engaging, particularly around culturally competent, culturally appropriate services. That, that's, that's a headline challenge, I think, mm. uh, we, we face at the moment. Well, of course, and that's going to be a theme that we continue to explore in this, in this webinar today. So welcome, Nicholas. So next we have uh, Dr. Georgia Paxton, who will be providing a response to the case study from a paediatrician's perspective. Uh, George, I note that in addition to your clinical work, you serve on a num in a number of leadership roles in government and other panels relating to refugee health. Can you tell us a little bit about how this uh, interest came about for you? Um, I landed in the migrant health clinic as the African migration peaked and it was different to any form of clinical care I'd ever provided and I was really interested in the fact that we needed different systems and that's probably been a platform for stepping into a greater role in policy. Great. Well, welcome, Georgia. And finally, we have Professor Louise Newman, uh, a psychiatrist well-known to many and certainly to me. She's a colleague of mine from Monash University as well. Uh, Louise, I note your work in advocacy for the rights of asylum seekers and refugees. Could you tell us a little bit more about the work that you're doing in this area? Yes, I've been involved um, probably from the late um, 90s as well. Um, started out um, looking at the issues of people from the former Yugoslavia and then became um, involved in issues particularly facing children and young people in immigration detention. Uh, and I've been involved as um, chairing advisory committees for the Department of Immigration um, trying to improve the situation um, of uh, those people who are within um, restricted uh, immigration detention. Uh, and I've also done work in um, offshore uh, detention uh, settings and internationally, so it's been quite a long-term interest. Great. Welcome, Louise. So uh, there are some ground rules that are noted there, and I just uh, bring that slide up for everyone's noting. Uh, and I go uh, move on to the learning objectives for tonight's webinar. So from tonight's webinar, we're aiming to better understand the mental health indicators uh, in the context of Yvonne's refugee experience. And the uh, case of, of Yvonne has been circulated uh, with the materials for tonight's webinar. We want to identify the key principles of the featured disciplines approach uh, in screening, diagnosing and supporting the health and mental health of Yvonne. And we want to explore tips and strategies for interdisciplinary collaboration for young people like Yvonne uh, who have come from a refugee background and who may have mental health issues. So uh, this evening we're going to talk about uh, Yvonne, a, uh, a Sierra Leone 
a uh, young woman whose parents were killed in a conflict and who came to Australia with members of her extended family when she was eight years of age. Uh, her current age is a little bit uncertain. We're told that it could be 16 or 17. Uh, she's experienced a number of uh, issues, including intergenerational conflict uh, at home and some degree of physical discipline uh, and violence, as well as racism and conflict at school. This has resulted in fairly uh, erratic school attendance, reduced performance at school. Uh, she's living out of home now with friends, uh, and she's presented to her GP with a range of physical and mental health symptoms. Uh, we're going to examine those in more detail tonight. She's been indulging in uh, risk-taking sexual behaviour, uh, and her ongoing clinical management is presenting a number of challenges, uh, and we are going to explore those challenges as well. The case is a complex one and will help us to really gain a deeper understanding uh, of collaborative mental health care models for individuals who are asylum seekers uh, and refugees. So what I'm going to do is now I'm going to ask each of the panellists to give a short discipline specific response uh, to the case study. Uh, so I'm going to start with uh, Christine to provide a GP response to the case study. Thank you, Christine. Thanks, Shanta. Um, this was a case that um, rang a lot of bells for me. I see a lot of adolescents from a refugee background with a very similar spread of issues. In fact, most recently yesterday, which was very interesting for me to consider yesterday's consultation in the light of, of knowing I was doing this this evening. Um, my, my first comment would be on, on the surface, it looks like an incredibly complex task for any GP, let alone a GP who's not maybe well versed in some of the specifics of, of refugee health to, to tackle. Um, so in, in summary, I guess we've got a, a female adolescent of uncertain true age from a background of probable severe sustained trauma and, and we're not even counting the ongoing trauma that my colleague Jill Benson talks about as not PTSD but CTSD, continuing traumatic stress disorder, um, when you think of the challenges that await and, and face many people from refugee background after they've arrived. Um, there's almost certainly the issue of intergenerational trauma, which as I understand it from a GP perspective is an incredibly complex one that I wouldn't even begin to understand, but I need to recognize that it's, it's there. The acculturation issues I'm very familiar with. Um, it's an incredibly difficult task for a family, let alone an incomplete family without the actual parents, to, to set about um, figuring out how to adapt themselves and guide an adolescent through an acculturation process without somehow losing their, their way. There are all sorts of issues that impact that I'm sure we will we'll discuss as the evening goes on. And it immediately strikes me that this case, um, like many of my cases, will challenge all our systems, not just our health system, but the, the school system um, and, and social systems. And, and ultimately, a lot of this can, can end up, I've seen it end up with um, child and family services, sort of goes, goes on and on, which starts to make you feel maybe a, a little bit um, depressed. But one thing that I come back to again and again is that although, yes, there are many complexities involved in people from this background, the essential skills that we're going to use and the essential networks that we're going to exploit are the same as we use for every single patient that we see. And I don't have to list them all here and now, but certainly with any adolescent, for anyone who works in and enjoys engaging with adolescents, I don't find the skills are really any different because it's rapport, engagement, communication, trust. They're, they're very generic skills and this is what I love talking to medical students and GP registrars about to sort of, w without pretending for a moment that this is going to be easy medicine, um, recognizing that they're the basic skills. Now a lot of GPs do lack experience in, in refugee health. I don't think that should be a turn off, but it certainly pays to have a few tips which I'm hoping we'll all be able to offer tonight for both GPs and other mental health professionals um, working in this area. From a GP <coughs> perspective, <clears throat> some of the challenges that would present with this type of case um, and that I've experienced with, with the, the young people I've looked after 
it's very difficult to a to ever get a systematic assessment happening mm -hmm. because of the presentation so often presenting in crisis and i think there's hints of that here you have to deal with what comes in the door and you can't say look <clears throat> not interested in talking about that today i need to do an assessment um, urgent issues um, come in with a young woman there in many domains including including sexual health risk taking um, and so it becomes fragmented it's mm -hmm. difficult to coordinate care as well as you might like to even within a practice often adolescents of from any background will see different practitioners within the practice they won't have kept a booked appointment so then they'll turn up for the unbooked appointment and um, because the problem hasn't gone away so you have to try and coordinate amongst your colleagues in the practice which obviously involves really good notes and verbal communication and corridor communication um, amongst others and in a case like this I think it's paramount that as far as possible the systems are speaking to each other, which I think is a huge challenge and that would be what I'd point to as one of the biggest challenges about this because as a GP there isn't actually a really good framework to do a lot of this communication. You, you're doing it you know, off the side of your desk, you're doing it often after you've seen the person or after hours when you can't actually contact anyone. Um, it's the kind of case that um, a case conference might end up certainly being something you'd want to at least broach with the young person, but there's going to be complexities inherent in that as well. I wanted to really talk about the issue of trust because trust is going to be an under pinning thing and um, in my situation I see these whole families so I would be seeing Yvonne's family and I would have to somehow negotiate that and um, I look after several young adolescent people from refugee background who have high conflict with their families and so you mm -hmm. do have the mother the father the grandparent in on top of you saying do something about this young person. You're the GP. You tell them this is not acceptable behavior. Mm -hmm. So there's lots of complexities. Um, I was struck by the issue of control, and I think control uh, for me is often an issue. Uh, this young woman, if I, if I go to the young woman I saw yesterday, until two weeks ago, she had a lot of control over her life. She, she was in Africa. Um, her comment on arriving here was, that she felt partly dead because people stay in their houses all the time and she couldn't go out when she wanted and she had to go to school and so there's a lot of loss of, of control when they come into this environment so I would need to be showing this young woman that she can actually achieve some c control over her situation at this stage and look there are many other issues that are mm. probably more bread and butter like the issue of access to the services, you know, how she actually gets there, how we help her, how we reinforce appointment times, SMS reminders can be really useful. So I'm sure we'll go into some of these things as the evening goes on. There are issues for the practice. It hasn't been easy in my very diverse metropolitan practice, um, ensuring that, you know, everybody's on the same page and making the practice both as friendly for us and for the clientele as, as, as possible. And then lastly, I was struck by the importance of age determination. Um, this is a very sensitive age around, you know, 16, 17, 18, where even a year can make a lot of difference. So that's going to be crucial as well. So I really just tried to, I guess, summarize my response to, to the case and some of the things that I think would underpin my approach. Thanks, uh, Christine. That's really helpful. And of course, the registrants are, uh, are very interested in a number of the issues that you have uh, talked about, and we're going to be drawing uh, upon some of those themes, particularly in terms of access, cultural sensitivities in practice and so on uh, uh, in just a moment. So thank you. I'd like to now uh, hand over to Nicholas, uh, who's going to give us uh, a perspective uh, about the case study uh, from a, a mental health uh, nurse's response. Thanks, Nicholas. Um, thanks very much. I, so I guess my slides again reflect what came through to me when I read. Through to me when I read, uh, and uh, I've just taken a couple of quotes from the case to to begin that sort of discussion with. Um, and I guess the first one is um, this no, this point made about no memory of her parents who were killed when she was four years of age, um, and that took me by surprise. And I I began to wonder about how that 
determination might have been made and um, being mindful of the possibility that Yvonne may self-censor if she's interviewed with other family members, but also the possibility of that memory being in the form of images rather than a verbal memory or something that she could readily express. Um, her, the demands that were placed on her prior to her arrival to Australia, um, described as something that she enjoyed, high levels of autonomy, taking the responsibility of caring for her younger children. But of course that would come at a cost and that parenting role or that pseudo-parenting role would have left very little time to devote to her own emotional care and well-being. And I guess then there were questions about what happened when she was um, engaged in health services at the age of 15 um, and what was or what should have been the clinically informed response put forward by what would have been then a range of healthcare providers uh, when she fell pregnant. And there are two conflicting statements, um, one really around the point being made where she performed well in primary school, making friends very easily, and yet um, a conflicting statement about having conflict and um, uh, a, a direct manner of communication. And I just began to wonder about racism and the experience of that, and whether or not in primary school racism is less palpable or less the self-awareness of racism is less apparent but when later when people become aware of nuances and their language proficiency and social skills develop they can pick up on those nuances mm. so it just begin to open up I guess these these slides are really about beginning to open up about her experience and what might be the backstory to contributing backstory to some of the things that we read about in the case and the point, that, uh, the point being made, and this is something my, my colleague in South Australia, and I don't know if she's online tonight, Monica McAvoy does really well in a nursing leadership position in, across the state. And that's really about meeting Yvonne where she currently is and um, just identifying how comfortable she might be about working with uh, a female or male health professional. And, and I think it's very important in situations like this to accommodate those preferences very early in the relationship. Um, trust has already been mentioned and trust is a fundamental requirement for mental stability. But trust is also fundamental in delivering on trust. Um, and whether or not there's scope for a person like Yvonne to have engagement with a community group, because I think in this story, community is missing, um, and it's something I might come back to. Um, working out or jointly exploring what her explanatory model might be. So we have, a, I guess, an expression of an explanatory model in the case, the way in which her symptoms are presented, when, how, and why help is sought, and what the writer of the case describes as an optimal outcome or what are the issues in an outcome. But what about her voice? What about her perspective? And whether or not there's scope to try and understand her, pers her perspective using her language and her experience and then working backwards from that. Um, certainly identifying and mobilising relevant protective factors, meaningful protective factors, and being alert to risk protect risk factors. I'm sure we'll come back to all of those sorts of things. And asking questions about her alternative education path. So what is her alternative education path outside of school? Where are her peers and role models? And where is the local community? Um, you know, how, uh, is she involved in work or other activities within her local community or is she involved in work and other activities, school activities, sport activities uh, with people outside her immediate cultural group? So I guess there's some, there's some uh, first person um, awareness and trying to understand her perspective. But there's also um, trying to understand the backstory, what might be some of the historical factors that have led to some of the descriptors that are expressed in the case. Thanks, Nicholas. I mean, uh, the, certainly a very a comprehensive uh, picture is now emerging uh, of Yvonne's case and, and, and from the approach that you've taken. Uh, I'd like to now uh, hand over to Georgia Paxton, who is going to give us uh, a paediatrician response uh, to Yvonne's case. So, uh, 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 Georgia, over to you. Um, 
I work in a service where we provide health assessments and long-term health care with a fairly flexible model of service delivery. And I was reflecting on how we manage young people like this and basically we actually approach it from a health angle first, sorting out what Yvonne's priorities are. Um, dealing with health screening and immunisation, people of African background who arrived in the 2005-06 years generally won't have actually had initial health screening and probably won't have had um, initial immunisation even. And dealing with that and explaining what the screening means and providing information on why we're looking for things is actually quite a useful process because almost certainly I will find things on the screening test which I think probably actually helps to build credibility. Um, she will almost certainly have low vitamin D which is one of my favourite topic areas. Um, if she's got dark skin and she lives in the southern states that's a certain. And if I can sort that out and treat it, it will actually often deal with a lot of the physical aches and pains and I would always treat vitamin D first before attributing symptoms to somatisation and the vast majority of young people I see get significant pain relief and feel a lot better. Similarly, any adolescent girl who's iron deficient and has menorrhagia until proven otherwise and sorting that out, dealing with periods is a terrific um, introduction to trust and healthcare and people feel a lot better when their iron deficiency is treated and all of this would occur over two visits and if she did present with family I'd go through the general stuff first, families often appreciate that and then make sure we had some time alone and deal with sexual health on the second and there's a variety of things that need to be covered. Um, once I've at the same time essentially I'd also be trying to sort out what the social situation is and really for this young person she's in chaos, she's not at school, she's effectively homeless and how has it got to this point, what's been the timeline, what have been the circumstances. She's 16 so she's compulsory schooling age, she should be at school so why hasn't the education system stepped up to the plate and looking at who's been around and how it's got to this, the termination of pregnancy should be included I guess in this section. And then after dealing with those things, looking at um, the developmental perspective in terms of adolescence as a time of development. One of the areas I found really helpful to engage young people is talking about young people of refugee background school experience, how long it actually takes to learn English, the fact that adolescents or kids when they arrive in the primary school years will take at least five years to be thinking in English, adolescents take longer, knowing that you lose school content whilst you're trying to figure out what the teacher said and move between. She's actually an English speaker I presume, although Guinea is a French speaking country so I'd explore that. What's school been like for her, explore the racism, talk to her about what support's around and then adolescent risk screening. I this, I actually was very pleased to see Shantha works on sleep but I spent a lot of time sorting out sleep and have found that sorting out sleep is incredibly helpful to deal with anxiety, to deal with rumination, to deal with intrusive thoughts which are often at night time and to help normalise routine. So I act, manage that very actively. Look at screen time, content, Facebook, social media time. I My other job is in nutrition so I'll be in there with a dietary history and through this figure out what does she want, what does she want of school, what does she want of housing at the moment. Um, with age assessment I would argue that you can't determine age, you can only assess age. It's actually a really good opportunity to then go back and get the deeper, deeper exploration of the narrative history and that's often where I find the detail um, is revealed. It's to actually assess a young person's age you have to know who was around when they were young, where were the points of transition and it allows you to actually ask about family members, about who was where, when and what might be around in terms of age to look at the care relationships, to look at the attachment. It's actually a brilliant introduction to the narrative history in someone who may have had their story taken many times and find that quite intrusive. If this is something they want to pursue it's really helpful and it allows me to examine schooling, settlement and identity and I think it's not 
straightforward and I explain the process, I explain what I'm going to do, but there are definite pros and cons of assessing age and changing birth date and I am very upfront with them. Basically, if her age is changed from 16 to anywhere near 18, she it has huge implications for service access, for case support and I've had a number of young people where everything stops because the birth date gets changed yet they're still in year 10 and they've still got the same issues. Um, and then following up with that and actually writing a letter involving the young person in the process, correcting it with them and putting in that form 424C, I think again helps them to realise that you are actually advocating and meeting their needs. And once all of that is covered, it's only then that in my experience I start to get to some of the mental health aspects. It's almost never revealed initially. I think provider credibility is really important. I, most of the young people I would see with this kind of story would actually be with the help of an interpreter. But I think having already done the health stuff, I've sorted out the medical contributors and I can say, look, we've sorted out your vitamin D, we've sorted out your iron, we've sorted out your other problems in terms of this is what we found, this is what we've done. Do you think feelings might be a factor in how you're going now in these symptoms or whatever situation. Other kind of key tips I've found helpful, I find the concept of dual permission is really helpful. You can tell me anything and I won't be shocked. I've heard stories like this before, but you don't have to tell me anything. It's your story. Um, and that's often actually, um, I think, quite a relief to young people and they can choose when and how they disclose. Also, some teaching I had recently, which had huge resonance for me, was thinking about that Adolescents who've experienced very significant trauma as young children make a different sense and meaning of the trauma as they have increased cognitive capacity and um, a better developed self-identity and it's that issue of how they handle looking back. Most of my work is with primary care and GPs and I would involve the family where I can but on a in a negotiated process it's unclear whether this young person is presenting with family or not. I think that's my last slide. But Thank you, Georgia. There's a question uh, just from one of the registrants, just a clarification. Could you just briefly explain Form 24C? Form 424C um, is a very important form. It's the Freedom of Information form to change your um, birth date, which can then change your um, my migration paperwork. Thank you it's very much. Thanks, Georgia. That's that's very clear, and I uh, hope to come back to you uh, to pick up on some of those issues that uh, that you've raised there, particularly in terms of coordination of services uh, that you just you just mentioned in your last slide uh, with general practice involvement of the family and so on. Uh, a number of the registrants are particularly interested. Uh, in, in those issues. So now I want to hand over to uh, a psychiatrist, uh, Louise Newman, to comment uh, on the case study from a psychiatrist's perspective. Thanks, Louise. Thanks, Chanza. I guess the, the initial point is that what, um, what state a psychiatrist might need to be involved. Um, this is a young person clearly who is having major issues, as we've all stressed, in their adaptation um, and in adolescent development. So. We'd be concerned, obviously, about school failure, difficulties with peer and, and family relationships, potential of maltreatment within uh, the family, unstable accommodation or virtual homelessness, risk-taking. So a whole range of um, really quite significant issues and health implications that do need to be um, sorted out. One of the major questions that I would have um, is how we can better understand um, how we've got to this to this stage where this young person is really having um, multiple difficulties in adaptation and particularly the role of trauma and all the uh, trauma and loss that, um, that she um, has experienced and how that's impacting on her current difficulties um, and uh, some of the issues that might need to be a focus uh, of attention. So we have real concerns about a young person who for the first um, eight years of their life has experienced a whole range of traumas. I think some knowledge about um, culture and the historical context of where she's come from, the situation in Sierra Leone, as people may be aware, as clearly one of attempted genocide. Um, many uh, children uh, were exposed in that situation. 
um, as witnesses of horrendous uh, human rights violations, massacre. Uh, many uh, families had members who were uh, killed and who experienced torture. Um, and this uh, child, this young person, has lost their parents. That could have been under um, really tremendously um, traumatic circumstances. So we have to ask whether that trauma and loss um, is still active in her mind mm -hmm. in the way that we might think about a post-traumatic uh, presentation. The other um, issues that I think from a, a psychiatric and mental health perspective that we need to have a look at are current issues about depressive symptoms, anxiety symptoms, the um, issues that they might be there in terms of risk um, of self-harm um, and even suicidal ideation um, to a young person who's clearly um, very stressed. Uh, and an important clinical point um, is working on those issues that others have mentioned about trust, about the difficulty we can expect this young person to have in, in engaging, um, and essentially in complex care systems, working out who might be the, the best person or persons or service um, that she can actually in, engage with. Uh, and often yeah. high-risk young people vote with their feet. Um, they will go to some services and not others. They might be able to form uh, trusting relationships around some issues. And I think we have to be strategic and use whatever points of entry that we have to actually try and help them. Um, and we can work then um, in um, a stepwise fashion on some of the issues. So, for example, although my focus might be on trauma and post-traumatic stress disorder and the complex developmental effects of uh, trauma and stress um, on a child, those issues are unlikely to come up um, uh, in initial um, meetings and it might take some time um, to build up a relationship where a young person might actually need to or want to disclose some of those issues. So we do have to have some evaluation of their current capacity to engage and how we might actually um, work with that. So I would like to look at depressive symptoms, um, the need um, to see how depression and anxiety might be contributing to some of the issues. Young people, um, and again this is a culturally um, um, influenced presentation um, from some young people which, uh, from some cultural groups are more likely to present with somatic symptoms. So physical complaints might, might have uh, different ways of verbalising um, emotional issues and be able to do that to a greater or lesser extent. So we need some cultural uh, understanding of where this young person is coming from. Um, and the same applies to our very models of trauma. She might be experiencing stress symptoms from our point of view in terms of a Western um, approach to thinking about PTSD, but she might have her own very different understandings of that. And the other thing um, in engaging with a young person uh, with this sort of background is that I think it might be helpful to think about how she has survived what she's been through. That she probably has a whole range of strategies and approaches to attempting to live with what might be very unpleasant symptoms and experiences of stress, memories of trauma. Um, so her way, um, as is common in adolescence, in general, but particularly adolescents from traumatic backgrounds, might be um, to not engage or to engage um, in a very ambivalent way. So sometimes to be able to talk about things and then maybe uh, not be able to follow through with treatment recommendations. And we have to factor that in and, and I think expect that um, as, it's, as it's really quite common. One of the issues I think is very important is intervention. Um, mm. And the difficulties that we have um, as particularly in, in mental health services at the moment in uh, firstly understanding complex um, cultural presentations and the refugee experience. But also there are real limitations in terms of our evidence about appropriate interventions with young people from these sorts of backgrounds. We're very interested obviously in helping um, better identify those who are having um, complex responses to trauma, um, but we have a particular model um, which is the Western psychological model of trauma recovery. And I think it's probably um, not appropriate that we just assume that we can take um, particular Western models of treatment and assume that they'll work and apply those um, without modifying them, without exploring um, in much more uh, depth that mm -hmm. particular cultural group's understanding of trauma and recovery, um, which may be very different from the model of our mainstream uh, treatments. 
The other thing I would think about, particularly for this young person, um, are um, issues related to the expression of depression. Um, and again, it's, uh, we can't assume that people from different cultural groups will be able to um, express in our terms um, a psychological model of depression, um, but we do need to evaluate that. Um, and sometimes there might be um, a role um, for specific um, treatments for depression and anxiety, depending on the symptom profile and how significant that might be. And as everyone's mentioned, I think the complexity of this case um, is the need to think about how we can um, engage, if it's possible, the extended uh, family. There's often in uh, refugee families some uncertainty about relationships. And of course, there's intergenerational uh, conflict and sometimes cultural clash, particularly around adolescent development, the rights and uh, responsibilities of adolescents. And this young person is clearly, um, in a way, trying to deal with a very different cultural uh, context, which might be in conflict with that of the um, extended uh, family. And very importantly, uh, I think as others have mentioned, the, the idea that we need to be able to work with these, these young people in terms of establishing a sense of purpose and meaning in life, and uh, one that helps them actually come to terms with and uh, accept their own histories, but to be able to mm -hmm. move through that. So, so to have some fundamental engagement with um, educational or vocational engagement, whatever she might, um, she might need. So um, I think part of the challenge for us all uh, in thinking about a case like this is uh, which services and professional groups uh, can engage with which parts of such a complex picture um, mm. and at what point do we call each other in? Yes, no, uh, thank you very much, Louise. Look, I, I think you've opened a number of issues that I can see uh, registrants are also asking. And I might uh, now open it up for uh, a conversation, I think, among our panel members, uh, drawing upon some of the issues that you've, uh, you've raised in your presentations. So um, while we get set up for that, there's a question that's come from one of the registrants, which I think is uh, is. Uh, quite representative of some of the early questions that came as well. So, look, I might put this to uh, to, to Christine. Uh, the, the question that's come is, how do you deal uh, with asylum seekers uh, who, who do not want to go to a mental health professional, for example, a psychologist or a psychiatrist uh, for cultural reasons? Mm. Um, it's got very dark in Hobart. Can everyone still see me? <laughs> we can oh, see you. Yeah. Um, so for a start off, um, in my experience, and I'm more experienced with refugees who arrive with visas than asylum seekers who we've really only had in Hobart for about 18 months. So that's not a big area of experience, but I can speak to it because of the asylum seekers I have seen. This is most of them. Most of them do not wish initially anyway to see a psychologist or a psychiatrist. Drawing on what Georgie said earlier on, I think it's really important to establish immediately that they're not going to be you know, forced to see anybody, that that's absolutely their call. That, that defuses the situation considerably. And I feel that if you've generated some rapport as a GP, you have little choice really but to, to step into that role at least initially until you've had a chance over repeated assessments. And I absolutely advocate seeing asylum seekers and, and other really traumatized people very often. So usually weekly. It took me years to, to figure out that when somebody's really difficult and you feel like seeing them less often, then you actually see them more often. So the mm. asylum seekers that I'm currently seeing in this situation, who generally do not want to see a psychologist or psychiatrist, um, will see me weekly. And I'm acutely aware of my lack of any specific skills in the area, but <laughs> aware that the rapport and trust and connection that we're generating is really important. And sometimes oh. I share them. I have a colleague, and we may see them week about. Thanks, Christine. And I understand that you have uh, a question that you'd like to ask uh, the other panelists about uh, uh, assessment uh, I in this context of Yvonne. Would you like to put the question uh, to, to the other panel members? Yeah, sure. I just looked at the question um, again. And look, it's, it's probably far too big a question, but I, 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 it's something obviously I wanted to ask because I asked it. Mm. And it is, you know, how can a GP approach an assessment of possible profound intergenerational trauma in, in a young person?
Look, uh, I might suggest that, uh, Louise, do you, do you have a response to that? Uh, how, how a GP can approach an assessment of possible profound intergenerational trauma in a young person? Look, I've got a, a one-word response, and that might be um, cautiously. Um, and I say that because um, the young person um, might not be able to um, tolerate, at least initially when we're first seeing them, uh, much in the way of thinking about that. Um, in this case, we've got a young person engaging in running around and risk-taking behaviour, which we might see as a way of avoiding a focus or thinking about uh, trauma and the very difficult situation she finds herself in. Um, she's in a state of, of conflict, if you like, because obviously she um, would desperately uh, needs and wants to be connected um, and um, accepted by, by family um, and her community. On the other hand, she's a trauma survivor who has, is operating, if you like, on a, in a survival mode, uh, which means um, sometimes not getting too close to people, um, avoiding discussion of painful uh, things that might bring up painful feelings and so on. And we see this in a, in a whole range of trauma survivors. However, it is, uh, I think the GP, particularly someone uh, who has a good relationship um, with a young person like this, is actually um, probably much uh, more comfortable in um, going to the GP um, about a range of issues than she might be to going anywhere else is ideally situated um, mm. to leave the door open to that sort of discussion. But I would be cautious about it. I'd certainly try and respond to what she brings up and maybe ask some very um, um, general, if you like, or opening uh, questions um, that let her know that you have um, absolutely some sort of understanding um, about the dilemmas that she's facing. And you can even, I think, use that sort of language, any of us can, when we're talking to young people like this. Yes. Um, to be safe, them, this is a really hard situation to be yes. in. Uh, you're not sure where to go, and sometimes you feel hurt or, or rejected, and so on. So, Louise, while I uh, have you there in the spotlight, I, I understand you've got some questions, uh, one in particular about uh, psychosocial adaptation uh, to a new home. Would you, would you like to put that question to the panel? Um, yes, that was a, a question about how we can um, try and understand the difficulties that she's having, uh, this young person, in adaptation in terms of the refugee experience. So how has her experience of displacement, dispossession, um, loss of parents obviously, loss of culture, um, shaped the difficulties that she's having now? And importantly, how do we think about recovery from that sort of experience? Mm -hmm. what, what should our expectations be? and how can we help her? Um, maybe um, Nicholas Proctor might have some views on that. Yes, I was just, just going to ask for Nicholas's thoughts <laughs> on that. Uh. <laughs> okay, well, that, that's a great question, and, and it's one of those things that um, people themselves um, are not readily able to and disentangle other from other aspects of, aspects their, experience. Of their experience. But um, one thing that I think shows up as being an important strategy, if you like, is to is to use issues and experiences that happen on the day, happen on the day of the conversation or have happened that week um, as part of the um, explanatory opportunity to understand her perspective and look for associations between things that might be happening um, November 2013 and things that may have happened um, in past experiences. Um, and sometimes that might might be um, also just allowing not just so much the verbal behaviour but the non-verbal behaviour to flourish. So the therapeutic use of silence to be able to open up that space mm -hmm. for feelings to be received um, and her life to be revealed. Um, so, so I guess a combination of things that are meaningful for her that are in her everyday experience um, that are not necessarily... Um, part of a verbal communication but they in fact may be uh, features of a non-verbal communication or that space between um, herself and another person mm. and allowing allowing her as much time as possible to to really um, explain how did it get to this you know just if I was to role play that I mean just say look you know go back as far as you like but how did it get to this um, take as much time as you like to be able to do that um, so I guess they're the, they're the kind of things that come to mind um, in thinking about that question. 
So Nicholas, I think that uh, relates very nicely to a couple of questions that are coming in from, from registrants to tonight's session as well. And one of these is the complexity when an interpreter is, is brought into the, uh, the mix. And of course, in Yvonne's case, that's, that's, that, that's not the case. But uh, how do you, you you've talked about uh, the importance of communication, nuances in communication. What do you do now and how do you manage effective uh, communication when you have an interpreter involved? In mental, in mental health, I have a very strong preference for level three NATI accredited interpreters to be used. Mm -hmm. And that's because um, that, that extra level of training and insight um, is, tends to be very useful around metaphor um, and, as I talked about earlier, explanatory models and expressions. Um, for smaller groups, um, we don't have a lot of level three NATI accredited interpreters. Um, and so confidentiality is a, is a major issue, um, particularly in the smaller jurisdictions and, and for example, South Australia, Tasmania um, and some parts of regional um, WA and New South Wales. Um, but allowing, um, I guess, as much as possible uh, for the interpreter to have, for there to be continuity with the same interpreter, so making sure those bookings are made well in advance and, and there might be some gender preferences around that as well. So right. there's four things that kind of immediately stand out um, yes. in working with interpreters. Um, Telephone interpreters are, are very difficult, you know, the line can drop out um, and sometimes sadly, and, and this is not a broad criticism, but sometimes it's been my experience to find that they're, they're making a cup of tea or cooking dinner while they're doing the interpreting. So that can be a problem as well. Um, I, can I comment on this one as well? It's Georgie from Georgie. Pediatric Perspective. Look, we, my service sees, we see between 800 and 1100 attendances a year and about 80% of our um, work is with help of an interpreter. I think we work a lot with the newly arrived communities and the emerging languages and the reality is, is we don't have level 3 NATI interpreter qualifications. I think there are lots of practical tips and tricks to understanding this work. I think it's um, a real problem that training on working with interpreters is not included in the undergraduate health discipline curricula. The practical things we have found is firstly we would always define confidentiality with an adolescent but I separately define interpreter confidentiality and it's a really good thing to do. So I will go through what I have to hold confidential or not and then I say and the interpreter is completely bound by confidentiality. They can't tell anything that we talk about in here and that's a good entry for young people. Um, we, I think using very simple language and I can see some of the comments from um, uh, registrants down below about having interpreters trained to exactly, to say exactly what the clinician says, I actually disagree with that and I think having worked with interpreters for a long time, it's about recognising there is a degree of flexibility and if I use simple language it is easier to interpret and you get a sense that the conversation is flowing, you have the three way dialogue. The other thing that we have found to be a revolution is we ask our interpreters to wait inside our clinic with the other staff not the waiting room and we brief them and we debrief them and we ask their opinion on how the young person presented and did their language make sense and what was their take on it. Um, there have been instances where we know confidentiality has been breached, we'll simply avoid those interpreters. At the same time we're running a clinic which where everyone needs an interpreter and there are lots of logistic issues with that but I think there are lots of practical tips and tricks to working with interpreters and it can be fine. We have mm. found it to be an incredibly culturally informative experience and I think recognising their professionality and what they bring to the dialogue uh, just is an enriching thing for clinical care, probably mental health care but certainly for health care. Terrific, Georgia. Look, uh, while, while I have you there, um, a number of the registrants, even before uh, the webinar tonight, have asked us a lot of questions about uh, access to service and system issues. You had a question that you wanted to uh, pose to the panel uh, about, uh, you know, w whether mental health services would take the person. Could you, do you want to put that yes, to sure. the panel members? Um, look, I'm quite embarrassed because I missed my slide on services, which is appalling because it's one of my 
um, kind of key areas which I think is a real challenge. My question for the registrants as well as for the panel was would your service take this young person if they have resilience, if they have performed well at school, if they're saying they don't have symptoms, if they don't turn up to their visit, would you actually take them? And what happened if they didn't turn up to the first or second or even the third visit as well? I might start with Louise, if I could, and see what uh, what your thoughts are. Would you would your service take this person? What would happen if they didn't turn up for several appointments? It would depend, um, I guess, on um, the referral process, the referral pathway, and what she's mm -hmm. actually referred for. Um, in terms um, of our area, I, mean, I guess um, this is the point that it's uh, highly variable around the country at the moment in terms of what actual um, services we have. Um, for young people, particularly from these backgrounds. In my area, yes, um, this uh, young person could go to a refugee health uh, service which has uh, mental health practitioners situated there, co-located. And that's um, part of an approach that we've developed um, to really try and improve access um, for these sorts of um, uh, problems, which are often, as we're talking about, quite complex in terms of working out how much it might be uh, mental health issues, how much are physical issues, um, and both need attention. If, on the other hand, I were to try and um, uh, have this young person go to mainstream uh, public sector child and adolescent mental health services, that would be difficult. At the moment, um, those services are largely um, focused on um, very acute presentations and are very stretched. Now, some of that's resourcing, but uh, I think part of the problem that we face is that many mental health services are not necessarily um, culturally uh, informed to the extent that they might be able to mount a better response to someone from a refugee background, particularly someone who is a trauma survivor. So there's a lot of interest in the moment, a lot of discussion around uh, trauma-focused uh, care and how to improve within the mental health system the capacity mm. to actually understand that trauma can present in various ways from physical mm. Uh, it can mimic or look like other mental health uh, disorders. Um, but I think it's quite reasonable to say that we're going to get very variable response. Um, if it's mainstream um, services, they will have a limited capacity to respond. Um, if we have the luxury of having refugee health services, mm -hmm. then she can get a very good response. I yeah. would actually be looking at what's also available in the broader community and not necessarily um, think that we always have to send people to mental health services. Right. Um, in many ways it would be better if we're building up um, refugee services and other community health approaches which are more youth focused and easier to access. Mm. Well, thanks, thanks Louise. Uh, Christine, do you have any comments about uh, uh, the, the question that Georgia had posed about whether your service would take this young person and what your, res your service's response would be if they failed to turn up uh, to several appointments? What would you do? Yeah, it's a really good and a really practical question. And um, so in general practice, um, people from refugee background in Hobart have great difficulty accessing GP services. We're reliant on a small group of GPs who then do most of this work. Um, and there is very disappointing uptake of use of interpreters amongst the wider GP community. That's an issue we have again and again, so back to interpreters. So our service certainly would be one of the services targeted um, in a small community, everybody being aware we do refugee health, yes. So we, we would, would <coughs> probably receive a secondary referral if this young person was attending a different general practice and it wasn't working out, um, and we would prioritise her as an adolescent. And I think that's an important point to make because we get mm. secondary referrals for lots of adult refugees and we don't take them all because we can't. We would prioritise a child or or an adolescent because that's just how it is. We recognize you've got that absolutely precious window of opportunity where you have a chance to make a real difference as opposed to working with a lot of the adults where you're just not going to have that same amount of traction. So yeah, she, um, she gets in pretty rapidly with us. Terrific. Uh, thank, thanks, Christine. Uh, one of the uh, com uh, or, or themes that were coming from the registrants' questions was also the potential role that uh, schools could play uh, in uh, you know, a situation like uh, Yvonne's. Uh, could I ask you uh, to start with Christine? Um, 
you, you know, the, one of the registrants, for example, is a, is a guidance mm -hmm. officer serving many schools. Uh, and what are some of the important things to consider uh, for, you know, integrating uh, students into a classroom playground situations uh, and helping them to uh, relate well to other students and to their teachers? It's a really difficult one and I can speak just from experience which is that if you're working in the sector and it's a small place like Hobart, you rapidly get a feel for what schools are better equipped to, to cope with the spectrum of issues and, and you know you need to as much as possible work with individuals. I always need a name for who I'm working with. I need to generate rapport with that person so emails will go back and forth within the boundaries of confidentiality phone calls also and I think it's not until you have a clear idea of the school, the, the school counsellors or, or social workers or whoever and often it's not very much and um, only then can you really start doing systematic work with, with the school. Otherwise, I think it's just general stuff, like understanding that most of my young people, um, adolescents from refugee background, absolutely do not want to be identified in any way mm -hmm. as being different or special or yeah. special needs. It's just so important. You've got to work with this young woman, and I can guarantee you that she will not want to be singled out in any special way whatsoever. She will just want to have her mobile phone and she will want to be Facebooking and looking to the world like everything is fine. And can I add to that, I'm not sure this young woman will want to delve into her refugee trauma from eight years ago. Mm -hmm. She will be much more focused on what's happening for her now and that will, my sense of working with clients like this is it is all about the housing, it's about the um, financial cash flow, it's about getting her back into school. I think schools carry a huge amount of the care load for young people like this and even just getting her to school and getting the routine of school, if there's any teacher or young person she connects with at school, if there's a counsellor, they actually do a huge amount of work to getting stability in her life. I would also add, just looking at the registrant's comments, I'm not sure torture trauma services would take her eight to ten years after arrival and it's actually very hard to get people in when they've been here a long time, even though that might be when they're finally ready to um, consider this as older teens. So, could basically, you, sorry, sorry. sorry, could you? It is a consistent uh, uh, sort of a series of comments that are coming uh, about uh, res you know torture and trauma and how that would be dealt with. Could you just comment a little bit on, on on the point that you just made? I mean, in this case, Yvonne, you said it's probably eight years after uh, the events, but could you just talk a little bit about services uh, that might be able to uh, be accessed in general for torture and trauma? Um. In terms of the options for this young person, mm -hmm. on the whole the group I work with need the help of an interpreter so private psychology is out. I can try community health centres and that's often my best bet. Um, school counsellors often feel very overwhelmed by this and beyond their remit. I wouldn't be able to get her into camps due to age and geographic restrictions and chances are she might not turn up. Um, I, there are, I've actually not got anyone to get the headspace um, and they come back to us in our medical clinic um, or go to the GP. So hence my initial slide about working with the GPs, I really struggle to get young people into services. And the other thing I would comment on, two comments, firstly, the intake process is very lengthy as a clinician. For me to spend an hour with a service and then an hour with another service and then an hour with another service is actually a very big commitment. And when I have occasionally got young people into mental health services, they find the process of seeing an intake person and then seeing a second person and then seeing a third person who might be the person that can prescribe, they find that baffling. They just can't understand all these same people asking the same questions. And so they'll come back to me. Um, I'm interested to hear if that's Christine's perspective, but I think we have so much of a focus on intake and assessment, but not on therapy. It's actually quite problematic from a clinician's perspective trying to access those services on behalf of young people. Christine, do you have a response to yeah, sure. oh, that? Very, very quick and um, yes. easy response which is exactly the experience in, in Hobart. Um, as GPs, we don't even try to get these people. <laughs> Clinician burnout is really important. We, it becomes too hard. 
we, we just deal with them ourselves. We use the torture and trauma service. They do their absolute best and they do a great job getting the young person to, you know, engage, obviously, as we already said, is an issue. Um, we have a few great services and it's not good to spend a lot of time talking state-based stuff in this forum, but, you know, Reconnect is a service run out of Colony 47, an NGO in Hobart, that, that, and then there's another service there too that will look specifically at um, young people who are either homeless or at a risk of becoming homeless because of conflict mm. within the family and they can be really good if you can you know get to the top of the waiting list thanks uh, thanks christine i might uh, ask uh, nicholas had a a good question that i might uh, ask him to uh, draw upon now nicholas you had a question about uh, the use of a uh, deep narrative assessment interview in this in this case do you want to just i thought louise might uh, be a good person to consider that uh, that question you have um, yeah, look, thanks very much. It, it's really just that opportunity to um, ask the question, just how did it get to this and, and allow the time, uh, allow that space for feelings to be received and experiences expressed. And I, I really do wonder whether or not that's happened in Yvonne's case um, and if it has, what has been, who's done that, what's been the outcome as a result of that. What I'm more inclined to think when I read the case is that there's been a series of brief assessments or brief interviews mm -hmm. or brief interactions. Um, and I, I would be very keen to know what Louise thinks about that and what, what, what are the potential pros and cons that are, um, surround that possibility. Louise, we're uh, rapidly running out of time, but we've probably got about a minute or so. But uh, if you'd like to share your thoughts to Nicholas's question. Yes, um, very in, very briefly, I absolutely agree. I think that that's a very important mm. uh, process and that's what I would say is pretty central to this idea of recovery from all the various experiences that this young person has had. Um, the important questions are, are when is she ready to do that? Who might um, be able to engage her in that sort of process? I would probably agree that torture and trauma services, if they're available um, for her, so service providers with real experience in dealing with this level of trauma and loss would um, probably be very um, well suited to being able to do that if she could uh, engage to see them regularly. But the whole idea of being able to come to terms with trauma, it doesn't mean forgetting trauma, it doesn't mean minimising trauma, but it means developing a containing narrative, so a way that trauma and loss can be lived with. Um, for adolescents, that's a very difficult process. They might spend considerable periods of time avoiding that and not finding that easy at all. So it might not be the right time. There might be other more pressing issues that need to be resolved first until she finds herself in a safer mm -hmm. place to actually start that process. But I would certainly be working towards that. Thanks, Louise. Look, uh, we have so much that we can talk about and the, the registrants are raising some really uh, important uh, questions as well. Unfortunately, we're, we're, we're running out of time and what I'd like to do is to ask each of the panel members to just provide a one minute uh, you know, summary of their reflections. Uh, I'd like particularly one of the themes that's emerging for the registrants' comments at the moment is uh, you know, different uh, cultural groups' responses to mental health issues, uh, issues of stigma and so on. So uh, if you kind of can think about that uh, when you provide uh, some your, your, your uh, reflections, but perhaps Christine, I can just ask you to uh, provide your uh, final thoughts uh, on this particular case. Thank you. Yes, yeah, certainly. Um, so six other cases were going through my mind as, as I worked on this case tonight and kept coming back again and again to uh, what's been a theme. I think it can't be stressed enough. Um, Nicholas mentioned it, George, I think everybody mentioned it, is that every professional working with a young woman like this is going to absolutely have to be prepared to focus on what are the issues from her perspective. Um, and it's so interesting looking at what they 
probably are um, alongside what we would love to focus on, like intergenerational trauma and acculturation and, and, and mental health access one disorders, et cetera, et cetera. Mm. Um, I think for the other half of my minute that I would like <laughs> to talk about resilience, about that has been mentioned also, to really put resilience up there, how resilient this young woman is bound to be. She's going to come through and she just needs, like any adolescent, even though her situation is incredibly specific, um, above anything, she needs people, preferably plural, as in, you know, mm -hmm. about a boy and, you know, Hugh Grant and all that sort of stuff. Um, she needs a lot of people to just support her till she gets there and she'll probably get there. Thank you, uh, Christine. Some wonderful thoughts there. Uh, Nicholas, could I uh, ask you to just give me a quick uh, summary of your reflections? Uh, yes. Um, first my reflection first reflection is, to, is just to spend uh, a bit more time thinking about the role of schools. I do think there's a role for schools, particularly around understanding that the level of self-regulation that might be expressed by children in Australia, in the Australian mainstream, will be different to people mm. who have refugee um, experience, particularly new arrivals. So supporting schools to be able to understand that and, if you like, have a, a vulnerability consciousness, to have a consciousness of that vulnerability in, in the school environment, I think, is really important. And the other thing is, to, is just to let people know about the MEMA website, www.mhima.org.au. Mental Health in Multicultural Australia has a, has a raft of resources, a blog and other links that address a lot of the issues that we've talked about today, which is um, a freely available, all downloadable, freely available. Thanks, Nicholas. That's uh, that's certainly very helpful, and it's in one of the concluding slides. The uh, website uh, uh, for oh, that, uh, yeah. that 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 link is there. So, uh, thanks very much, Nicholas. Uh, Georgia, could I uh, ask you to just provide your uh, final reflections on on Yvonne's case? Um, I guess three main points. The first is that. To my mind, mental health is part of health and I'm intrigued that we go so far to try and actively separate them. We have quite different service systems, whereas combining them, I think, can actually be an effective way to engage with a whole range of communities and groups. The second about managing this young person's situation and case is, I think, understanding our goals and starting with achievable goals and moving towards larger scale goals. So it can be something really basic to start with and moving from there. And then the third is about being more flexible as services. Our service started as an assessment service. We've changed because the people and population demographics and need change. We do a lot of developmental work, a lot of cross-cultural developmental assessment. And I think we probably do a fair bit of mental health, although we wouldn't call it that. Um, we give people our contact and we say you can come back and with that the families do come back and they bring the cousins and they bring the extra kid they sponsored and our attendance rate is actually 88% and has been for five years and we only see this level of complexity. So I think if you use phone reminders and you are flexible and you do offer opportunity, you can actually learn and engage and have a great time working in this area. It's been quite an amazing privilege to work with these communities. Thanks, Georgia. Thanks, Georgia. Uh, Louise, uh, Louise uh, just conclude uh, with, your, uh, with your reflection. Yeah, sure. Um, I think that one of the, the, the issues that comes through for me is the Absolutely need to really understand different cultural perspectives on, particularly on what psychological well-being or mental health actually means. Mm -hmm. We do need to understand what other people's models are before we start thinking about engaging them. It'll help guide us in our interaction with them. We need to understand where she comes from. We need to understand what her experiences are likely to have been, even if she can't um, disclose that or doesn't want to disclose that um, with us. I think the basic perspective that we can take is one of trying to uh, maybe do something with, um, which is much more about understanding her perspective, um, her story of trauma and loss and uh, how we can then understand that much better. And that means 
But there are multiple perspectives possible on that. Um, uh, but the aim of working with her, whichever um, service or model we're working within, will actually be to help her over time piece it together for herself in a way that gives her choice, flexibility, might be able to reduce some of the risky behaviour, help her regain a sense of purpose and meaning and of attachment and reworking relationships. I think what that means in practice is, in a practical sense, is being very much guided by the young person themselves, mm -hmm. being sensitive to what they can tolerate and what they can't, being available, having an open door and being flexible in terms of our frameworks. So when the question was raised before about what if she misses appointments, um, many people from trauma backgrounds will find those sorts of demands in terms of being there at a certain time, behaving in a certain way, very foreign to their experience. If they're feeling overwhelmed, they won't come. They might want to come the next day. Um, I have a man, a, 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 a former detainee, uh, a survivor of um, physical and psychological torture, who just rings me out of the blue and he says, I'm coming to your office now. Uh, whether I'm there or not, and it's I'm okay. I might say, well, I might be interstate or I could even be overseas. And he says, no, I'm coming to your office. <laughs> so what are you saying to me is he needs to be, um, have control, a sense of control yeah. which was stripped from him by experiences of torture and trauma. And I think similar things apply for this young girl. We need mm -hmm. a human rights framework. We need to respect her right uh, to have some control and help her build up a sense of self-efficacy. Uh, and in terms of her engagement with us. Louise, thank you uh, for sharing that perspective. I, clearly, uh, the uh, registrants also are endorsing a number of the statements that uh, you all are making as well, and I think uh, it's certainly resonating with a number of the clinicians who are, uh, have, have registered for the session uh, tonight. Uh, we could go on uh, and explore this issue. Uh, it is complex, and uh, we, we really uh, uh, justifies quite a lot of uh, deep discussion, but unfortunately, we're soon running out of time. Um, so I wanted to thank uh, the panel members uh, for sharing their perspectives on this uh, important case. Uh, I wanted to thank all of the registrants for continuing uh, to the, uh, participate with interest. Uh, we have 257 uh, registrants online, I see, uh, and I wanted to thank uh, the Mental Health uh, Professionals Network for hosting uh, this important webinar. The case really uh, highlights the opportunities for and the advantages of collaborative uh, mental health care to support a young person like Yvonne from a refugee background. But clearly, as our panelists have, uh, have highlighted, uh, there are also significant challenges uh, from the point of view of coordination across systems and sectors uh, and as well as ensuring cultural sensitivity uh, in practices uh, and also in interventions. So I want to uh, encourage uh, the participants, uh, all of the registrants today, to think about setting up uh, special interest networks, exploring mental health uh, in young people from culturally and linguistically diverse backgrounds. Uh, I want to also uh, encourage you all to complete the exit survey, uh, which helps the Mental Health Professionals Network shape uh, future webinars. Uh, there is an announcement uh, for, the, for the next webinar there, a collaborative approach uh, to supporting uh, uh, patients with coronary heart disease and depression anxiety uh, on the 3rd of no uh, December. Uh, finally, as, uh, as Nicholas mentioned, uh, there is uh, support for this webinar and the materials provided for it uh, from uh, that particular uh, website there. Uh, and the website is, uh, is shown again there for your, uh, for your reference. So thank you to everyone uh, for participating in the webinar tonight, and that brings us uh, to the end of the session. Thank you very much. Thanks, Sean. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks for listening.